I'm going to start right in the middle of the story in the book of Acts, which is just this whole fun story after story after story of the church starting and getting off to the races. And then at some point in the book of Acts, it switches from the guy who wrote it telling what happened to telling what happened in the first person because he had joined the story. He was traveling with this guy, Paul. So Acts 21, verse 10, after we, so this is Luke writing, after we had been there for a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, so I've got a belt, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and his feet with it, and said, the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. Lord Jesus, we come under your authority this morning. We submit our hearts and our minds and our lives to you. We thank you for the fullness of who you are. We thank you for the gift of prophecy that we're going to talk about this morning. We thank you that these things originated with you, not with us. And we want to be aligned with you and how you're working and moving and communicating and revealing yourself to us. In your name, we pray. Amen. So they run up on this prophet, Agabus, and they have this situation where the belt is tied and it's very dramatic. Whoever continues on will be bound by uh, the Jews and will be, you know, this, this, and this. Well, you can kind of interpret what happens in actuality a few different ways because actually what really ended up happening is Paul was bound by the Romans. So he was actually ended up a captive of Rome, not necessarily bound and cuffed that we see record of by the Jews. So in one sense, the fact that he was bound, that he was captured, that he ended up being um, taken away as a uh, hostage was true. Exactly the way that that all played out didn't happen necessarily, at least from what we can tell, the way that Agabus said that it was going to happen. We're going to come back to this verse, but here's a portion of the verse that we're going to come back to in a, in a minute. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. If you're in the back, stay with me. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. When it comes to prophecy, each of us have had different experiences that range from great and life-changing to confusing and in some cases greatly disappointing and discouraging. So maybe this is you. These aren't going to be on the screen for you, but just listen. Maybe this has been your experience with the world of prophecy. You were told something was going to happen and it didn't. Maybe someone prophetically spoke about a specific area of your life and it did happen. You couldn't believe it. Maybe someone spoke prophetically about an area of your life that brought healing. Maybe someone spoke recklessly or manipulatively and it caused hurt. Maybe God gave someone an insight into your life that unlocked a closed off space between you and and God, like you came alive or there was this area of your life that was locked down, like for unforgiveness or something. And this word that was so on the money just like unlocked it for you. Maybe some of you, especially here, and I mean here that at RCC, feel that you're not quite RCC material if you don't operate in the prophetic through words, images, and dreams. I have heard from multiple sources in my time here. Um, of people saying, you know, I don't know. It feels like there's this, everyone in the church is prophetic except me. And what's so interesting about that is that I've heard so many people say that, 
And there lets me know that there's a misconception because so many think they're the only ones on the outside. Well, actually, there's many in that group that are feeling disconnected from the prophetic because they don't think that they do it like some others in our church maybe operate in that gift. So there's maybe mystery around it or it feels like a, a disconnect or like there's people who can do it and people can't. And if, if you can, then maybe you can be more a part of prayer. You can be more a part of certain ministries in the church. And uh, you don't know quite where you fit in or what it looks like for you to engage with this gift. And maybe you haven't said anything. Maybe you've said it to me. Maybe you've stuffed it down and, um, and you'd like to just create some space. The other side of this is, is that some of you are here and you've probably, Ruby, that was perfect lead in. You've had images, maybe even during this series. I know that I had someone that was here from out of town communicate with me after one Sunday that they were just getting all of these things that were just rising up in them, images and impressions and things like that for the first time. And they didn't really know where to go with them or what to do with them. So maybe that's been happening in you since you've been here and you're trying to figure out where do I put this? Maybe your church experience, if you had one at all, didn't fit into a category that had a bucket for you getting images or words or pictures or dreams. Maybe some of you have dreams about people and they come true and you don't understand that or you dream and you see something and then the next day you're like, is this, was this what it was about? Or you feel like you're supposed to say something to someone and you don't know why. I remember one time Jocelyn and I, I wasn't planning to tell this babe, sorry, Jocelyn and I were at a lunch with a couple years and years ago, you would never know them in the world, okay? <laughs> They're back there. I'm just kidding. And we were having lunch, and Jocelyn uh, had grown up in a denomination that taught the gifts are no, no more. We're going to address that in a minute, but these things are over. They're done. They fulfilled their purpose in the early years of the church, and thank goodness uh, you don't need the Holy Spirit anymore. I think we do, but uh, anyway, that was what she was taught, and there's been a lot of people that were taught that, so I don't say that. As a stab, I say that is that's reality for many people. While at the same time, she didn't understand. So we're sitting there with this couple, and Jocelyn says, and we're making, like, we're getting to know them, right? And Jocelyn says, I feel like I'm supposed to say something about his secretary. And like, I was like, Jocelyn, we were going to be friends with them, you know? <laughs> that is now over. Now we can tie things up here, finish the meal. I will pay for the check, and we will leave. Um, no, actually, what happened was there was a conversation that had been going on between the two of them that had nothing to do with him, but was something that his wife had been noticing that she felt like was unhealthy um, in the way that his secretary was relating to him. So it had more to do with a conversation they had been having, and all that God did in that moment was let them know that he was aware that that was going on and maybe letting the husband know, you might want to listen to your wife here. She might see something that you don't. She's not trying to be distrusting. She just may see something that you're not seeing in the dynamic between the two of you. So it actually ended up being a good thing. But at the time, we weren't living in this realm of like prophetic and all this stuff. So we didn't have a good bucket or category for what that was other than it happened and God brought it to, to the scene, and it was helpful, right? Like, it was helpful. So, what, I, what I'd like to talk about is prophecy, the prophetic in the church, and prophetic words. So, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. Here, here's, our, here's our list of these gifts that we've been calling, like, the manifest gifts or the miraculous gifts, okay? Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are a variety of ministries in the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things and all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. And to another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. And to another, the effecting of miracles. And to another, prophecy. And to another, the distinguishing between spirits. Is this a good spirit or is this a bad spirit? Okay, um, to various kinds of tongues and to another, the interpretation of tongues. And we will talk about that in a couple of weeks. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he will. So I have told you that this Holy Spirit, 
You're filled with the Spirit. We don't all get our own individual Holy Spirit. There's one Spirit that fills all of us that unites the church. And then we don't all, there's not like all your gifts are on a gift shelf and God selects this one. Item number 472, that goes to Tim, you know, and then you get your gift that way. It's the Spirit in you that manifests the gifts from within. Now, you, it's okay for you to see them as receiving, but ultimately what's happening is you receive the Spirit and you're praying for these gifts to be activated, to come alive, to manifest in you and flow out of you. So how does God speak to us or reveal himself to us? So this is important conversation to have if we're going to talk about prophecy in general. It's just helpful to have a bigger conversation and then narrow down. So I'd like to start big and then we'll funnel down to the specific topic of the day of prophecy, okay? You guys still tracking? All right. So I'm going to talk about the types of revelation. So you go revelation, like the book of revelation. No, I mean revelation, like, you know, same root word is reveal. Like how does God reveal himself? Okay. What are the ways that we receive revelation from God? Okay. There's some theological terms that are familiar to about five of us. Uh, The rest of us, they're easy enough to understand. The first is called general revelation. Okay, general revelation. Paul wrote in Romans 1, Since what may be known about God is plain to them, talking about mankind, because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that man are without, so that men are without excuse. So God didn't skimp on creation like this, you know, it's, he, he didn't do light work there. Like it's, it's elaborate, it's impressive. Um, uh, the universe is, is crazy. We're discovering more and more and more and more about this. And there's a lot of scientific uh, explanation these days. Obviously, we've watched science grow in understanding. And there's two different ways, to, uh, broad categories, it's always unfair, but two different broad categories to understand science. One is science disproves uh, God, the other is uh, God has invited us into his creation and we're discovering him in more detail and greater understanding. Uh, we, as a church, uh, not to say where you're at as an individual, but we as a church land on the second. We're not anti-science, but we know that science, um, as Nikki Gumbel with the Alpha Course likes to say, can very easily answer what and a lot of times how, even though that changes with discovery sometimes. It doesn't answer why. You know, we don't get why. Like, there was an explosion, okay, why? Or there, there was these stars and this thing and all these planets. And all right, well, why? And then why did it explode? And what exploded? And why was there something to explode as opposed to nothing to explode? And what does that mean? And what does that tell us? And why is there um, a desire to know why? And uh, why did it explode into order in many ways? And why is there math that helps us understand this. If we do understand, why is there math? Why would there be order? Why would there be explanation? There's just all that stuff that you have to wrestle with, right? But in other words, Paul, kind of in an Eastern context, before math was as big as it is, well, I guess it was coming on the scene with um, the philosophers and the Greeks and all that, but he, would, he was like, God's made it plain. Like he put a lot, God put a lot of work into this, so to speak, and it's, he's revealed himself generally to everyone. Now, in many ways, if we've missed it, whether that was ancient cultures making up many gods or, or the way that we can explain him away now, he has generally revealed that there is a creator. Okay, He has generally revealed that there is a creator. So general revelation. The second is special revelation. The writer of Hebrews says right out of the gate uh, in, in chapter 1, In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets, at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. Paul said in Colossians, it was through him all things were made and by him all things hold together. So now we see that not only the one that uh, created everything that's revealed himself generally has revealed himself specifically in man And we know that these scriptures specifically reveal him. Jesus stood up and said, the law and the prophets, those are are about me. Everything that you know about the the covenants and the sacrificial system and the firstborn son importance and all the things that were happening in the Old Testament, that was ultimately leading to me and that was ultimately pointing to me. So when you read the scriptures, you're receiving this special revelation that's centered on Jesus Christ, centered on who he is. 
uh, John said that he is the word of God made flesh. Like John was trying to help us understand like the word of God made flesh is Jesus. So the specific word of of God uh, here, the scriptures, reveals the son. And that is a special way that God has been revealed to him. Jesus like, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. You know, so there's this special revelation that we have. And then the third that I would like to talk about, which is what we're going to talk about today. I don't know if anyone else has coined this phrase, if, if so, and I'm, I'm stealing it ignorantly, but it's what I'm just going to call partial revelation. You guys still with me? Okay. I was like, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Okay. First Corinthians 13. I asked you, then I'll make fun of you. First Corinthians 13, 9 and 10. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. Okay, so let's go back to your particular church tradition, or you may not have had a church tradition and you're a blank slate that you're actually easier to work with today. Okay, depending on your church tradition, you may have been taught that prophecy was only supposed to last during the early era of the church to forge it. And uh, you were probably force fed this verse that I'm about to read. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I fully am. So I read about we prophesy in part, when the perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. That was 9 and 10, and then 11 and 12 are the verses I just read for you. So the teaching in, in some of these circles, it's, it's very, there, there are very godly, Jesus-loving people that teach this. I want to say that, okay? Like, same team, right? But the teaching in those circles is that um, uh, the perfect that comes w- was the Scripture. That when the Scripture comes, w- when we have everything. And that just, that assumes a lot. It, I think that Paul knew that he was under the inspiration of, of, of God. I think he knew he was under the inspiration of the Spirit and that he had authority when he wrote because he acknowledged such things. But did he know that he was writing the Bible? I don't think he sat down and said, today I'm going to write some more of the Bible. You know, there were a lot of people that contributed to the Scriptures. But one of the other places that you have to land on this is if you really do the work and you really get in there and translate it and it says we'll be face to face when the perfect comes. Well, the Word, the Scriptures, all this will never pass away. But the Scriptures don't have a face. Like Jesus has a face when the perfect comes. That word face means face. Like when the perfect comes will be face to face. And he's calling this church into maturity. When I was a child, I thought like a child. And he's really addressing the way that they are using spiritual gifts, but he's addressing the way that they're abusing one or or maybe misusing one, tongues. And he's actually calling them into prophecy. He's not trying to explain away anything. He's trying to call them into prophecy, as you're going to see in just a few minutes. Feel free to read on that, read deeply on that, ask questions about that, uh, study that. Um, I know many, uh, have heard of many uh, read commentators that would be considered really good that I know do not practice these things, but when they look at this verse, they say, I'm talking about the guys that can like pick up the Greek and read it, you know, they, they, they say, yeah, but this is clearly talking about Jesus, not when the perfect comes being the Bible. Like there's a lot of good scholarship on this, but there's also, like I said, people who love Jesus and are completely sold out to him on the other side. Same team, all right? So I say that graciously, but I want you to know this is where we land, this is where we experience it, and um, we long for them to taste that and see. Uh, And there are probably things that they believe that they long for us to taste and see. So we want to remain gracious, but we also want to stand uh, where we stand and land where we land, okay? All right, so let's go back to partial revelation. Partial revelation. That's prophetic ministry in the church, okay? Prophetic ministry in the church. Do you understand why I'm calling it partial revelation? Because of that verse that says we see in part and we prophesy in part. Did you guys get that connection there? I don't want to assume, okay. All right. So the prophetic today is, here's a few things we need to know before, before we get into it a little more deeply. The prophetic today is not on the level with Old Testament prophecy, 
Okay? The prophetic today is not on the level with Old Testament prophecy. So you had people like Moses, Elijah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. There are psalms that were prophetic. Jesus fulfilled, I think it was over 300 Old Testament prophecies that he stepped into and walked in in some way, shape, or form. Um, I think there's 13 chapters in the New Testament that do not directly reference or quote the Old Testament. So the New Testament and the Old Testament are so interdependent on each other and just this beautiful outworking of one another. But these guys in the, in the, in the Old Testament were receiving words from the Lord that were Scripture. They were authoritative, meaning unchanging or to be fulfilled ultimately by New Testament. But they were authoritative in that they were not up for partial interpretation. Um, they were receiving downloads that were God's scripture to his people. And then the second thing we need to know is that the prophetic today is not equal to the gospels, the words of Jesus, or the New Testament letters. So Paul, Peter, John, James, these guys either walked with Jesus or had direct encounters with him and uh, have been acknowledged for centuries and centuries as those that have authority to teach. And you, um, there are definitely circles that question that and whether that's right and whether that's wrong. Um, I, some of those books have been in print for three or four years. Just wait and see if they stay in print. You know, just see how long they hang in there because we've gone through these cycles many times throughout history when there's an attack on the Scripture. It can come up strong. It can rise up in the culture. It's usually on the person and work of Jesus, and then it kind of gets put back in its place. Because, you know, Jesus has proved himself over and over and over to be true. So the scriptures have stood the test of time. There's a lot more homework to do for you to just say that these things are authoritative. But we do acknowledge that they are here. They're not always easy. Okay? Scriptures aren't always easy. There's a lot of hard things in here. And not just in the Old Testament, a lot of hard things in the New Testament. But we, we receive them as authority and we're willing to do the work to wrestle with them. Because we certainly want to be, um, uh, at a, if the posture is, uh, do we have a God does he have the right to say something that we may not agree with? Uh, I think he does. So we try to approach the scriptures humbly and work through the things that are hard to receive. But we do acknowledge the Bible as scripture. Now, why do I say that? I say that to say this. Prophecy today is partial revelation and should always be tested by scripture. Okay? Prophecy today is partial revelation and should always be tested by scripture. So if someone says, um, well, we have entire religions and belief systems that have started because someone had a prophetic download of some sort or had an uh, encounter with a being, right? And, uh, the pro and, and you go, well, Jared, that's all made up. I don't think so. I don't know that you can start a new religion or something without some sort of power that's beyond man-made. You just have to ask yourself, is that God's power? Does that make sense? Okay, so there's, there's power behind other world religions. You just have to say, who, who, where does that power originate? Where's that coming from, and how does it take so many people captive, right? So that's where you have to really test it and say, okay, so this feels good on the front end, and now the further I walk into this, oh, man, I, this really seems out of line with Scripture. It really seems out of line with what we're holding to is authoritative. Well, it's the same way in the way that we prophesy. Okay? That's our first test. Now, we can discern it in community. Sometimes it's not a matter of whether or not it's biblical. It's a matter of discerning it, discerning it as leadership, discerning it together, praying over it together. Uh, but we want to make sure that we understand that right now, in this time and era in the church, we, we prophesy in part. Okay? And we never want to elevate prophecy in the church over Scripture in the church because that can lead into a bit of a circus. Like you can get into a, a bad space to where um, everything's uh, prophetic and everything's a download and there's no accountability of truth over anything and the direction is always being set. And you don't want any men or women to have that much power and authority over what they think they're hearing if what they're hearing they're hearing in part and not in full, right? We still agree with, I mean, half the room, is it, right? I feel like God wants you to agree with me. I just heard that from the Lord. Just kidding. All right. That's irresponsible. I shouldn't do that. Follow the way of love and eagerly, eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Okay, so what is prophecy actually? Especially the gift of prophecy. 
For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Now, I'm trying to talk to you about prophecy, and Paul's going to talk about tongues a lot. Um, tongue, this church was gathering and like only speaking in tongues, and it had gotten a little out of hand. If you don't know what tongues are, I'm going to talk on it in a couple of weeks. He was encouraging them to not only kind of speak in tongues when they come together, but to also prophesy and to say some things that can be understood by guests and outsiders and each other. And so he's, 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 it almost sounds like he's being negative about tongues, but he's trying to counterbalance what's happening in the church. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with the Spirit, but everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their, under, for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. See, there you go. He's, he's covering his bases. But I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater. This doesn't mean you're a better person. He's saying you're, you're, you, in this time and place in Corinth, you can serve this church better in a better way than one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. He who prophesies is greater than one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. Okay, so the word prophecy is propheteia. And the simplest way to define it is an inspired utterance. Okay, an inspired utterance. You utter something that's inspired. It's not, it didn't originate with you. It originated outside of you. So it's an inspired utterance. So if you prophesy, you receive an inspiration from the Holy Spirit. Another word for this might be revelation, like a revelatory word. Okay, an inspired word or a revelatory word. Prophecy is foretelling and or revealing. Okay? It's foretelling. So our original story, the man who wears this belt, this guy made a whole made a whole scene about it, right? The man who wears this belt will be chained and he takes it and it's telling what's going to happen. It's foretelling, okay? Or it's revealing. You can, you can, you, uh, maybe you've been around here for a couple of months. We've had some words shared about a situation that someone's walking through, a, a particular illness that God once prayed for, um, a particular situation in life. Um, I know I heard one one time where someone uh, was given an image of a blanket that was a certain color that resonated with this uh, young lady from her childhood and unlocked something that let her know God was there you know, in her life when she was young, and it just turned the lights on for her, and it was just this beautiful moment. So it's revealing in the moment, or it's forthtelling. Okay, still with me? All right, so 1 Corinthians 12, 8. These two words usually get, um, the, these two types of gifts, you rather, usually get um, roped into this conversation, especially the way that you hear us talk about it around RCC. So to one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom or a word of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge or a word of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. So there are two camps on this, and um, at least that I found, and the two camps on this are both in the Spirit. We believe gifts are all the gifts are for today, but they understand these gifts a little differently. Okay, camp one. These are miraculous gifts that come on that uh, come on you in the moment, and and you you speak them out like you get a word of knowledge about something in the moment. That gift manifests, and you have this miraculous. Uh, this would compare uh, a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge to the other gifts that are in this section, like uh, all these sort of manifest or miraculous gifts, like healing and uh, creative miracles and faith, and, and things like that that seem obviously outside of the bounds of what you can do naturally, okay? Uh, camp two is that knowledge and wisdom gifts are more in line with the ability to teach or communicate deep truths or give mature and wise counsel from the Lord. So camp two would be that if you say someone has the word of knowledge or the message of knowledge, that you would be saying this person over time has a gift to understand the deep things of the scriptures and teach them or the deep things of God, and teach them in, in their knowledge. And there's some argument for that because he talks about knowledge a lot as he's talking about the Corinthians because they had made a bit of an idol to uh, knowledge. Uh, 
and understanding. Uh, or a mature person that's grown in wisdom and has walked in the Lord and the, the God, God has matured them into a person that you would say they give wise counsel. It is the Spirit that's given it to them, uh, but it's not this like uh, in the moment uh, prophetic word of wisdom that's coming, okay? I honestly, the people that I read on this, I trust, I'd be like, hey, I consider you friends, like, you, or I would like to be your friend. You're good people. Uh, you, you both believe in the Spirit, and uh, you believe in all the same things. Uh, you just interpret them differently. So the way that I would explain this is here at RCC, um, I don't know that we would have to fall on, uh, one, into one camp or the other. You could say, um, I'm re- I think I'm receiving a word of knowledge about something. Or you could say, I think I'm receiving a prophetic word. So if you said prophetic word, you would basically be saying, I think I'm receiving an inspired utterance. So if it makes more sense to you that camp two is what, what that might be talking about, then you can say, I think I have a prophetic word because there's space for that. If it makes more sense to you that camp one, these are miraculous gifts given to believers, and, and you think, no, I think word of knowledge is where I'm at, I think we can all accept that as long as we have a common understanding of what we're saying and how we're talking about it. Like I said, there's good, I think, healthy tension and interpretation on both sides. And both sides believe that God does give those words. One might call them prophetic words. One might call them words of knowledge, words of wisdom. Fair? All right. So what does prophecy or the prophetic look like in the life of the church? So he's giving this church in Corinth some specific instructions. So... uh, This doesn't mean that we necessarily have to strip down everything and do it exactly this way next week. But this is helpful just to see him talk about the order in worship. So tongues then are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers, not for unbelievers. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and some who do not understand or some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everybody is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all, and the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. So he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. In other words, if the deep things of our heart are revealed through the prophetic, um, it is a sign to an unbeliever or to a believer in the room that God knows their heart, that God's examining our heart, that God sees our story, that God knows what's going on, and that God can call those things out. And it builds faith to trust him for the first time. It builds faith to put our trust in God. We have many, many stories over the history of this church where people have had someone pray over them or say something to them, and they did not, that person would not, maybe didn't know them or would not know them otherwise, and they spoke this or prayed this or said this, and it was like, oh, this is a sign to me as a new person or unbeliever. As we've done Alpha, it used to be called Life Course, but Alpha Course, and uh, unbelievers come in and they get prayed over and um, like God shows up, the Spirit shows up and someone prays something and doesn't even realize it and kind of reads their mail and like an unbeliever, someone wrestling with the faith goes, whoa, like this is a sign that, that what, the, what you guys have been talking about is is real. It's not everything, but it's something. You know, it's good. This is, this is helping me uh, believe, and this is encouraging my faith. So how does the prophetic operate in the life of the believer? Okay? I hope this list is exhaust, exhaustive. I feel like some of you are going to get after me if it's not. All right? Okay. Uh, first is this, prophetic image. You've, you may have heard this around here. You may have been a part of a prayer time. Uh, where someone is praying and they say, as I'm praying, I'm seeing like a picture of something and it feels like it has to do with what we're praying about or what God wants to do this morning. Or someone could be praying for you and they could see a picture and it could help them pray more specifically for you and help you trust that God is working because it connects with you in a way that otherwise, how would they have known to say that? Um, One very real example is I had a friend come in here a few years ago, somebody prayed for him and he started really literally praying about Pokemon and he felt like Pokemon was, and it like connected some dots in my friend with Pokemon and the guy like was like, man, that was for me. I needed that. And I was like, really? Okay. 
Okay, all right. Uh, the next is this, um, prophetic word, prophetic word. So this could be a word about um, something that is to come. This would be what we would uh, obviously would call a word of knowledge if you use that terminology. But this would be uh, about something that is to come or revealing something that's going on. So like, um, I feel like we need to have a conversation about your secretary, uh, you know, prophetic word, right? Um, doesn't have to be. Uh, that jarring <laughs> uh, it might be an encouragement. You know, it might be an encouragement. It might be your God gives you something to speak over someone's life to call them into the next season. Like God's got something for you. It might be to uh, allow them to confirm something that God's been speaking to them that they've been wrestling with or doubting or that they've been asking for something and then someone prays and it connects the dots. So there's a lot of different ways that that can work out. Prophetic dream. Prophetic dream. These typically seem to happen in that hour or so of REM that you get, you know, when, when that's the time that you dream during your rapid eye movement. Uh, sometimes the spirit slips in. Uh, I've started to make a habit. If any of you show up in my dreams, which does happen, um, I mean that in an appropriate way, I uh, will text you. Sometimes I'll just see your face. I'll just see an interaction, or I'll be in a space and I won't know what's going on. I have done that before with someone who's not in the church, and I sent them a text, and they were going in for a big heart thing with their heart the next day, and it was like, oh, wow, like that's okay, that's confirmation. If something shows up, all you have to do is reach out. You don't have to know everything about it. You can let them know you're praying for them. Well, why can't you just pray for them? You can. Why reach out? Because you never know. It might build their faith that God put, put them on your radar. So you do that for them, Right? it might be an encouragement. Okay, prophetic warning. A prophetic warning. Um, uh, this, this can happen uh, in the church at large. This can happen um, in, uh, in, in your life. This can happen. Someone could walk up to you and say, listen, uh, in love, okay? Someone could walk up to you in love because they care about you. And they could say, listen, I don't know you very well, but I feel like the Lord is telling me that you are headed down a road and you know what it is. I don't, but the road that you're headed down, you're, it's going to cost you greatly and you need to turn back. Okay? Um, you go, well, that sounds mean. No, that's love. If someone cares about you enough to approach you and say that to you. But the Spirit could put, place that on someone's heart to do that. And that could be this prophetic warning. And why is it prophetic? Well, if you turn back... That doesn't have to happen. You see that a lot in the Old Testament. If you'll come back to me, Israel, then this doesn't have to happen. If you don't, this will happen. Prophetic warnings, okay? They need to be heeded, but they need to be tested, and they need to be in love. Prophetic impression. Um, you can get a sense or a feeling. Uh, someone spoke to me a few weeks ago and said that they had a, um, a sense about a particular type of hurt in the room. So you may be sensing, sometimes people will tell me on a Sunday morning there is a sense of apathy in the room or, um, or even more specifically like rejection or God wants to do something today about healing the relationship between sons and fathers or something, something like that. Uh, we'll hear these things from time to time. And those are, those are powerful moments. Um, if you trust the person that it's coming from and if it's tested, discerning, seems right, that can really be a way that we can serve. Well, that doesn't just have to happen here. That can happen um, in one-on-one -on -one encounters. Sometimes people get um, physical. Uh, um, you can call it like sympathy pain. Like a lot of people receive their prophetic words by, uh, man, my knee. I don't know. Oh, wait a minute. My knee's not hurt. What's going on? And then you start to pray into it and you go, oh, God might want to heal someone's knee this morning. And sometimes you can ask God for more, and he might give you more. Like they heard it, you know, riding a tractor, I don't know, and, they're <laughs> and, uh, and their knees hurt, okay? And, um, and, and then, then they go, oh, that's definitely me, okay? That's definitely me, and they respond. He may not give you that much. It might just be the knee, and you, you can uh, share it, and, and we can see what God does with it. Uh, a prophetic vision. I shared one a few weeks ago about Nancy had a vision of being a part of a church years ago and gifts were falling down into the people in the room and she was a part of a different church, but she didn't uh, feel like it was for that church necessarily, which was an odd feeling for her. And then when she came here and we started talking about the series, she felt the need to come up to me because in the vision, the people were in the round. Okay, 
Now, those kind of things greatly encourage me with the direction that we're headed. Like, that was a blessing to me, but I also felt like we all needed to hear that because that can be something that we can all open ourselves up to and pray into for ourselves and for each other. Uh, Prophetic prayer. Uh, This can be um, God is um, uh, leading you as you pray for someone. As I mentioned earlier, he's giving you he's he's giving you those nuggets, those things to say, and you feel like the Spirit's actually leading the way that you pray. This can also be as you're interceding. Some of you that are in the intercession space, meaning you almost stay in this place of prayer. You're constantly uh, praying. Um, as you pray, God can give you uh, specific ways to pray that you would not otherwise know. Sometimes it's right. I've been told by people in this space to let the people know. And sometimes you just sense that you're supposed to keep digging. Just keep praying into it and see what God does. But intercessory prayer can lead into this prophetic where he's showing you and teaching you specifically how to pray. And then there's a prophetic interpretation of circumstances. Um, This one is one that you definitely want to have the guardrails out for from time to time because, you know, uh, we as humans can sometimes read into it too much. Uh, But sometimes we're not reading at all, and we need to. Like, sometimes we need to be reading what's happening uh, and what we're seeing. And uh, sometimes you're like, man, well, this, 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 all these things seem to be lining up. It seems like the circumstances uh, through God's sovereignty and through his prophetic will are are actually trying to speak and say something about what he wants to do and how he wants to do it. Uh, I'm kind of drawing a blank on any really good examples for that right now, but it's... Rebecca's testimony. Yes, there it is. She slipped out to go get to work. She's got um, her big thing tonight. But Rebecca's testimony would be a good example of the circumstances. Wait a minute. God's doing something. Let me call back. This was prophetic. And it led her to do what she did. And it led to all these things that God wanted to do. All right. What do we do with prophetic words, gifts, images, etc. when we receive them? Okay. So just in general, as a part of the church family, what's, what's, what's the way to do this? I think some of you, uh, there's been some Sundays where I've sensed that they were happening, and we've, or someone else has sensed that they were happening, and we've decided to say, do you have any? There's been other Sundays where um, I felt like I missed it, and I was like, I should have asked if anyone had any words. Um, and then uh, there's been other Sundays where people just didn't know what to do with what they were um, receiving or hearing. So the first is, I would say this, pray and ask God what to do. What is the purpose, prayer or share? Okay, God, is this something you're calling me to pray into only, or is this something that you're asking me to share? Does this need to be known right now, Um, or is this something that I need to sit with for a while, pray into it a little more, and then share? Uh, Tell a leader or person of contact in the church. So if, if you don't know who to go to, Uh, Tell a leader or a person of contact. That might be your city group leader. They can help you get to the right place. Ministry leader, someone that works here, elder, pastor, something. Email our general email. Let's say you get a dream or something during the week. Email the church and say you have something that could be worth sharing or that you would like to explore. Okay? We have people that will help pray and uh, uh, pray with you, help interpret, get back to you. On Sundays, you can approach myself, Jocelyn, Melissa, who are nearly always down front. Okay, um, You can also approach Tim on the Sundays that he's serving in this capacity, if he's not leading worship or serving uh, with a different training or something outside of the room. You can approach the service leader or the speaker as long as they're not a guest. There may be some guests that can handle that, but we never want to assume that any guest speaker that we have can make a decision on what's worth sharing with our church community. We don't For one reason, we don't want to put that pressure on them. But secondly, they may not know or have experience in that space to the degree that they would, you know, be able to discern what's right for us. Sometimes we ask for them beforehand or when we sense the Holy Spirit's giving them. So sometimes you'll be prompted to come and share. And then if you do walk forward and share, which I don't discourage you from doing, like that's a good thing, right? Like that's uh, come up and tell us. Um, The decision to share it will be yes, not now, or let's pray and determine if it's for the church. 
Okay, so we might go boom. That, yeah, that, that, that this 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 feels this feels right. Like this this seems right. It might be um, yes, not yet. I think I know in two Sundays why God gave you this. We're going to be talking about this. Someone else might have a, a similar discernment or impression. Um, or it might be, hey, I don't know. Like, let's just hold off on that, you know? Like, you saw seven goats flying around the house. Let's just pray, you know? <laughs> I'm not saying, you know? Probably, hang around. You're going to hear, like, I'm serious. Like, that, you don't know, right? So you might just be like, let's pray. See who that's for. You might dig into it a little more, and God might tell you that's exactly for you. You might have an experience that week that you realize it was for, but we don't know if right now six, seven goats flying around the house is going to help us here today. But we may determine that it does. You know, like something may be going on, like God may be leading us into a farm ministry we don't know about, okay? <laughs> um, the important thing is, uh, and I do say this, and, and I... I, I we do this as leadership too. This is, a, this is an act of humility that we all call ourselves to. It's really good to test it with one or two people. So um, we don't want you to hop up here for your testimony and, um, and, and blindside us with something that um, you think God's speaking. Test it. Put it through, put it through uh, the, the, the conversation channels and let's, let's determine. Uh, we're, more, we, we're inclined to share the prophetic. Like, that's what we want to happen here. Uh, but we also want to protect you, protect the church. And sometimes there's some knowledge of something that you might specifically share that leadership, service leader might have an inclination of how that could be received that maybe you haven't considered. And it might just be a conversation about how are we going to talk about it. You know what I mean? So a lot of times there's just a shepherding pastoral element to it that you just need a little bit of uh, coaching on uh, before you talk.